So good afternoon, everyone. It is our pleasure to have at, at our seminar Dr. Archisman Ghosh today. Originally, I was inviting uh, Archisman to visit us in person, but of course, everything went out of the window. So we will have just an online talk today, but I hope that really we will manage to to have uh, Archisman at our institute when all this is over. So Archisman, uh, we'll talk about uh, with, uh, cosmology with gravitational waves, uh, but he, his career is is, uh, is a bit more uh, complicated than just sticking to gravitational waves. So he, after uh, getting MSc from uh, from uh, from Kal uh, Kalpur in India, he went to for a PhD to to University of Kentucky, and his PhD was in fact in string theory. Uh, but then he moved back uh, for for a post postdoctoral fellowship to India, to Bangalore uh, for four years, and I think this is when he gradually switched to gravitational waves in his research. And he ended up uh, later as a postdoctoral scientist in, in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam at Nick Hef. Uh, and now he is in Leiden, but I think he also has still the affiliation in Amsterdam. Uh, and since 2017, uh, he's a co-chair of Cosmology Working Group uh, of Compact Binary Coalescence in the LIGO-Vergo collaboration. So very complicated name that you see also on the screen, I think. Uh, and yes, he will talk about cosmology with gravitational wave observation of compact binaries. Okay, the floor is yours, Archisman. Uh, thanks a lot, Machik, for the very nice introduction. And um, uh, it is nice to be speaking, but still a pity that I couldn't be there in person. So for my talk, uh, uh, I tried to keep it at a very broad level, expecting uh, many uh, students from different backgrounds listening to me. So um, I also encourage that you stop me and ask me questions, particularly in an online talk where it's uh, not possible to see the audience. It's difficult to keep track of whether the audience is uh, following the material or not. So it would be uh, uh, best if you can uh, stop me and let me know uh, uh, whether you are following my um, uh, talk. So. Uh, uh, my talk will be about cosmology with gravitational wave observations of compact binaries. I will try to give a broad introduction to uh, gravitational waves and then go into the main topic, cosmology with gravitational waves in the later in half of my talk. Gravity, in a sense, assembles the universe from the smallest scale of planets to galaxy clusters, to the largest scales as the universe itself. Yet until very recently, gravity played only a very passive role in observing the universe. This scenario changed on, in 2015, on September 14th, when ripples in the curvature of space-time shook the Earth. These ripples, gravitational waves, which are predicted by Einstein's theory of general relativity where space-time is dynamical and has a curvature and hence can have propagating waves or modes in it called gravitational waves. They were observed for the first time by the twin LIGO detectors in the US. These uh, effect, of course, what you see in the video is highly exaggerated, but something very similar happened and we picked up a very tiny uh, ripple in the curvature of space-time coming from the merger of a binary of black holes. So on the video over here, you see the space-time curvature of two black holes which are rotating around each other. As they're rotating around each other, they're emitting gravitational waves. As they're emitting gravitational waves, they're kind of falling into each other. So they're moving closer together. They're moving faster and faster. Uh, below you see the gravitational waveform. Now uh, uh, the video has slowed down. 
uh this is the last stages possibly this these are the, the this is when the gravitational radiation is the brightest and is most easy to see eventually the two black holes merge and form a final remnant black hole which settles down to a final state this is picked up by the gravitational wave detectors then there were only two detectors in the us in hanford and livingston let's move on and i was expecting this okay i was uh, i was uh, wanting to play you a uh, uh sound but the sound doesn't uh, doesn't play for some reason uh what i would like to emphasize is the waves that the detectors pick up are in the audio frequency band so we can take the output from the detectors plug it into an amplifier and we are actually able to hear the sound many of you might already have uh, heard the sound on uh, videos which are out there uh i would encourage the others to go and listen to it it's a characteristic pattern of increasing frequency with time known as a chirp uh, produced during these last stages of the merger of the binary we are already talking about frequency ranges which are between about 10 hertz to uh, 500 or 1000 hertz and the observable Uh, uh the observable signal which is the strain the relative deformation which you saw vastly exaggerated with the earth shaking shaking is actually as small as 10 to the minus 21 10 to the minus 21 is really really small because over detectors which are about 4 kilometers long this produces a uh a displacement of 10 to the minus 18 meters 10 to the minus 18 meters is a thousand times smaller than even the even the diameter of the nucleus of an atom so this extremely tiny deformation is very very difficult to measure which is why it took about 100 years between the prediction uh, from general relativity and now to for gravitational waves to be detected gw150914 was the first direct detection of gravitational waves it was the first direct observation of a black hole it was the first it was the discovery of a class of heavy black holes of mass greater than 30 solar masses it was the first observation of a black hole in binary and it was the first observation of the of a black hole forming the final black hole formed from the merger of two black holes of course this single detection was followed by a second one and beginning the second observing run there was a third detection very soon a fourth detection the third virgo detector joined the detector network there was a fifth three detector detection and eventually we detected a binary neutron star a binary neutron star is a neutron star is uh, significantly different from a black hole in the sense that a black hole is uh, composed or only of only of gravity there's essentially no signature of matter in it while a neutron star is composed of matter so when two neutron stars merge the matter in the neutron stars they uh, interact and they are expected to give a flash of electromagnetic radiation in addition to the gra gravitational waves and indeed very soon after the gravitational wave signal there was a a uh, gamma ray burst ob uh, observed so uh, optical uh, telescope soon followed it up and an optical counterpart was discovered and the optical counterpart slowly faded away into near infrared far infrared uh, emitting electromagnetic waves 
at various wavelengths, eventually fading out as radio afterglows. This was the birth of multi-messenger science with gravitational and electromagnetic waves. Uh, this uh, discovery is GW170817. This confirmed binary neutron star coalescences as progenitors of short gamma ray bursts. This demonstrated them as prolific sites of heavy element formation, elements like gold and platinum. This constrained the speed of gravity with respect to speed of light because the gravitational and electromagnetic signal arrived almost simultaneously after traveling for so, so many uh, millions of years, essentially. This provided the first novel measurement of the Hubble constant, which is going to be most of the um, uh, topic, uh, which is going to be the most important for, for a fraction of, the, uh, of this talk. And it gave us access to the uh, neutron star um, equation of state to essentially the physical properties of the uh, uh, matter that these neutron stars are made out of. This is something that is also otherwise very difficult to measure. Is there a question? OK. Now, uh, the, uh, these advanced LIGO and Virgo detectors, they had two observing, the first and the second observing run. And the third observing run began last year. It unfortunately had to be brought to a halt uh, this year in March due to the current coronavirus situation. From the first observing run, we had 10 binary black holes and one binary neutron star with the counterpart. And the data of the third observing run is still being analyzed. We already have a noun, we already have a uh, second binary neutron star detection that was announced at the beginning of this year. And just a few weeks back, a very unequal mass binary black hole was also announced. As I said, we are still, uh, uh, we are still analyzing the data. We have 56 detection candidates already from the um, uh, low latency online observations. So it's expected that many of these candidates would be Mm, promoted to detections, and we would also have uh, a few more detections coming from the uh, high, high, lat high latency offline analyses. With respect yeah. to the observatories, Sorry. This, yes. Just, Mark, can I have a short question? Yes, I'm please. not sure if you will be covering that. Can you shortly tell us, uh, to non specialists, how it happens that? you promote things to detections. So what is the, in, in the analysis? So astronomers are used to, okay, there is a detection or not. In physics, maybe it's a bit different, but how is it in gravitational waves? How you, what happens that you have to kind of work on it to, to have a detection? Yeah, unfortunately I'm not, I, I was not planning to cover it. I was thinking I'll, I'll be including a slide on this, but I, I do not have a slide on this, but I'll try to explain in words. Uh, uh, what uh, we are essentially looking for is a signal that is very, very weak. As I, as I uh, showed you a few slides back, a gravitational wave strain of uh, 10 to the minus 21. And this signal is buried in noise. And the noise is probably uh, as large the signal, as the signal itself or probably even la larger in amplitude. So we really have to dig out this tiny signal from out of the noise. So quite often what, uh, what might happen is, uh, um, what we think is a signal is actually not a signal. It's, a, it's something that is there in the noise. Quite often what might happen is that we didn't uh, analyze the noise properly, but something in the noise comes out as a signal. So in order to get the, in order to extract all the signals, it is very important to do an analysis of the noise and try to see how often a certain kind of uh, what looks like a signal might be mimicked by noise itself. For the very loud signals, it's difficult for noise to mimic a very loud signal. 
but for very uh, but for uh, but very often some of these uh, uh, some of these uh, weaker, some of these l less loud s uh, signals, which we initially think is a real gravitational wave signal, turns out to be a noise artifact. Very often, what happens is a very uh, uh, a not a very loud si um, signal comes out of the data after a more thorough analysis is done. So that's why there might be things in the data which were not there in some of these detection candidates. Uh, Okay, uh, Marchik, does this uh, satisfy yeah. uh, yes, yes. Uh, your uh, question? Okay, are there are there any f further questions from the rest of you with regards to this? Okay, now with reg uh, with, with regards to the observatories, this slide is a bit uh, old, as in the colors are not correct. Uh, uh, this shows uh, uh, the detectors in uh, Livingston and Hanford and GEO as operational detectors. The Virgo has been operational for quite a few years, so Vir Virgo should be yellow. And the Kagura detector in Japan has also very recently become operational. And LIGO India, which is um, a planned detector in India is already under construction. So the color there should also be changed to green. But this is the worldwide network of detectors which we are expecting over the coming uh, five, uh, five or 10 years. And this worldwide network of detectors is expected to give us many, many more signals of the type which we have already observed. However, we are also expecting signals of the type we have not observed. We, are talk we have observed only compact binary coalescences, which are on the bottom left corner of my slide over here. These are transient sources, transient meaning they do not last forever. They last for a short time. Uh, they last for uh, a few seconds or even a fraction of a second. And they're modeled, which means that we know their exact waveform. We can predict their exact waveform from the, uh, uh, from the uh, essentially, in this case, the uh, properties of the source from the masses of the component black holes or neutron stars uh, from, uh, for, for, from their, for, or their angular momenta. However, in addition to these modeled transient sources, we have unmodeled uh, burst sources, which can come from supernova explosions. And we can also have uh, uh, sources which are not transient, but persistent, which, which are there for a much longer time. These could be uh, continuous waves from spinning deformed neutron stars. I know that many of you at Warsaw my, uh, are spe specializing in uh, modeling and detection of continuous uh, uh, waves such as these. And there are persistent unmodeled sources, which would be uh, the stochastic background. A part of the stochastic background is cosmological. However, a large part of this stochastic background is expected to be uh, an astrophysical superposition of all other kinds of gravitational wave sources. And we are also currently talking about a very narrow frequency band. However, there's, we can expect gravitational waves in a wide range of frequencies. It's just like we are now seeing only visible light. We, uh, we, are, we are still to invent telescopes, or we are still to get gravitational wave telescopes to observe the ultraviolet or the infrared gravitational wave radiation. Uh, as you can see, in addition to the terrestrial interferometers, one can have space-based interferometers like LISA. One can have alternate ways of probing gravitational waves, probing pulsars, and one can pro uh, probe gravitational waves indirectly from observations of the cosmic microwave background. However, for most of my talk, uh, uh, not most of my talk, actually for the rest of my talk, I'm going to concentrate on these uh, terrestrial gravitational wave detectors and also compact binary sources. So let us come back to these sources with a few uh, concluding words uh, bef uh, before the end of my introduction. When we look at these sources, the first thing that we notice are these wiggly waveforms. 
these wiggly waveforms are not something that we see almost anywhere else in electromagnetic astronomy and these uh, and this waveform uh, these waveforms already tell us that we are observing coherent sources now we are observing coherent sources means we are actually following the various cycles of the waveform this is imp almost impossible in electromagnetic astronomy ex except in uh, except possibly for some very low frequency radio observations uh, this is because uh, uh, the, of the uh, of the response time of the detector the response time of the detector is smaller than the time scale of the variation so we are actually able to trace the waveform for most of electromagnetic astronomy what happens is the uh, electromagnetic detector uh, response much 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 slowly uh, at least compared to the wavelength so we just observe many many cycles um, integrated over we observe only an overall intensity we are not able to observe the phase Another very related thing is the fact that we are observing the amplitude. In most of electromagnetic astronomy, we observe only the intensity, and this has an important consequence. Um, the intensity is the square of the amplitude, and we know that the amplitude falls off with the distance. So the intensity would fall off uh, with, as the square of the distance. If we build a if we build an electromagnetic de a detector that is twice as sensitive tomorrow, then that detector is going to take us to a distance that is square root of two times larger. However, if we build a gravitational wave detector which is twice as sensitive, then that gravitational wave detector is going to uh, take us to a distance that is twice as large, not just square root of two times. That means that it would give us access to eight times the volume. That means that by building uh, uh, more and more sensitive gravitational wave detectors, we can go farther and farther out in the universe much quicker than with electromagnetic detectors. Another thing that I would like to emphasize is that the observed, this observed gravitational wave signal, this wiggly pattern which we see, that tells us about the properties of the source. Now we can already see that the binary neutron star, which is on the bottom right on this plot, uh, it looks quite different. It is a much longer signal. It ha it is a much low. It um, is a much higher frequency, and this happens because uh, uh, with uh, increasing mass, the effective frequency, it kind of decreases. So already from the uh, uh, merger frequency, we are able to estimate the mass of the um, uh, source. Uh, by looking at uh, looking into the waveform in more detail, looking at the waveform uh, in uh, different detectors simultaneously, we are able to uh, reconstruct the other or, or, uh, various other properties of the source. These include the intrinsic properties of the source, which are the properties of the source itself, such as the masses, the uh, primary mass, the mass of the uh, larger black hole, or the secondary mass, the mass of the lighter black hole, the uh, the spin. And these masses and spins can tell us about the uh, uh, astrophysics. These can tell us about what kind of black holes are out there. These can tell us uh, what kind of formation mechanisms might uh, uh, lead, what kind of formation mechanisms might lead to these black holes. One thing, one additional thing, I would like to note is that these gravitational wave detectors are not very uh, uh, are not very good for pointing things in the sky. For most of these uh, sources, if you want to see where the source is located, we see huge, uh, huge patches, huge bananas across the sky. Only for a only for a very few sources, they are very well localized. This is, of course, going to improve as we put in more and more detectors. With more and more detectors across the globe, we are going to do better triangulation. All these sky bananas, sky patches, they are going to become smaller. 
However, still, we are not going to have a resolution of better than a few uh, square degrees anytime soon with these gra uh, gravitational wave uh, observations. This kind of brings me to uh, the end of the first uh, bit of my talk about introduction. So I'm going to pause and ask if uh, some of you have any questions. If not, I'm go going to move on with the rest of my talk. Uh, after this introduction to gravitational waves, I'm going to talk a bit about um, the Hubble constant. Uh, that's going to be an introduction to cosmology. I'm eventually going to move on to how to do cosmology with gravitational wave observations. I'm going to talk about what standard sirens are and how we can do uh, gravitational wave cosmology with galaxy catalogs. And I'm going to end with some uh, future prospects. So let's begin with the uh, Lemaitre Hubble law. What is the Lemaitre, what is the Lemaitre Hubble law? Observations uh, about 100 years back uh, told us that the galaxies in the local universe are receding away from each other. They, they, they are moving away from us. And this recession velocity of the galaxies in the local universe, they're proportional to the distance to the galaxy. This meant that galaxies which are nearby were moving away slower, while galaxies which are farther away are moving away faster. And this constant of proportionality is the Hubble constant. This law is the Lemaitre Hubble law. We now know that this recession is uh, supposed to be interpreted as the stretching of space-time itself. The galaxies are moving away, not because the, not because somebody has pushed them, but it's because the space-time itself is stretching, and this stretching of space-time is causing an expansion of the universe. This recession, this recession velocity is usually measured as a cosmological redshift, as something is moving far, uh, moving away from us. It um, uh, due to some kind of a Doppler effect, uh, all frequencies are uh, shifted towards the red, and this is uh, easy to measure. Distances are, are a bit difficult to measure. I'm going to come to that in a bit. But essentially, uh, by measuring these uh, uh, recession velocities and distances, one can measure the Hubble constant. So let's look at the first measurement of the Hubble constant by Edwin Hubble, again from about uh, 90, 91 years back. Uh, the first thing that you notice about this uh, plot is uh, Hubble, for some reason, for, uh, didn't uh, forgot to give the right units to the vertical axis. The velocity should be in kilometers per second. The second thing that you notice about this plot is if you actually measure the if you actually take the recession velocity and you divide it out by the distance and you try to calculate the Hubble constant from this plot, then the Hubble constant that you get is uh, larger by a factor of about seven compared to the value we know about uh, know currently. The, what you see here is. Uh, uh, a number of uh, about uh, 500 kilometers per second per megaparsec, but what we know now is a number closer to 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. This already indicates that this Hubble constant is a rather difficult quantity to measure. A large part of this difficulty essentially comes from measuring distances. As I told you, uh, redshift is reasonably easy to measure. Why are distances difficult to measure? The distances are difficult to measure because any measurement of distance requires a calibration. You, in order to measure distance, you have to start from very close by, you have to find some, uh, some way like parallax in a very nearby universe, then you try to find some standard sources uh, uh, which are slightly farther away, uh, you th then use standard, you use these, you calibrate these standard sources with nearby sources, then uh, uh, there's some overlapping region where some standard sources overlap with standard sources farther away. So in a sense, you need all these standard sources of known brightness at various levels. These are known as standard, can standard candles because these are sources 
uh, whose brightness are either known or can be modeled. And in this way, you construct the cosmic distance ladder from the very nearby scales to scales very far away. You have the distance like this, you have redshift, and you can measure, for example, the um, uh, Hubble law. There's another way of measuring the Hubble constant, and that measurement of the Hubble constant comes from the very early universe. So what you do is you have a measurement of the Hubble constant from, for example, the uh, temperature fluctuations in the CMB. This measures the Hubble constant not now, but back in the time from which the CMB is coming. However, this is a very precise measurement. And if you take this measurement and plug it into a cosmological model, plug it into a known cosmological model, you can take the Hubble constant from the time of the CMB and extrapolate it down to the present epoch and measure the Hubble constant at the present epoch. OK. It is now 90 years since the first measurement of the Hubble constant, and one would expect uh, different types of measurements, measurements using the uh, distance ladder, standard candles, and the measurement using the uh, early universe. One would expect these measurements to uh, become more precise, and one would expect these measurements to agree. Indeed, the measurements have become more precise in, uh, over the last decades. As you can see, the uncertainties in each of these measurements. The orange here is the uh, the orange here is from the um, you know, local, essentially supernova, which is standard sources. While the green band here is from the early universe. All these bands are shrinking, which means that these measurements are becoming more precise. But these bands are slowly going to different values. The local and the early universe measurements of the Hubble constant, they no longer agree as we go to higher precision. What could the problem be? A problem could be that uh, with uh, the calibration in one of the many steps of the multiple, uh, in one of the many steps of the multiple rungs of the cosmic distance ladder, uh, something could be going, uh, something could be going wrong over there. However, there is another possibility. For the early universe measurements, although it is a very precise measurements, we have to plug in the cosmological model to extrapolate the early universe measurements to the current time. It might be that something is wrong with the cosmological model which we are using. The cosmological model which we are using is the lambda CDM model, which is where well, lambda is the dark matter, uh, or la lambda is the dark energy, and the CDM is the cold dark matter. So this is where gravitational waves can come to the rescue. Gravitational waves can act as standard sirens and uh, they can provide a completely independent alternate measurements of the Hubble constant. As you can see in the plot, the first results from the gravitational wave measurements are already on the plot. And it's, uh, of course, these are, not very these are not very precise measurements yet. But as you can see, we, uh, these measurements are comparable to what we had with uh, supernova about 20 years back. So how do gravitational waves act as standard sirens? To, under, uh, to understand that, we need to, uh, we need to appreciate again that we are observing coherent sources. We are observing an amplitude as well as the phase evolution. The phase evolution of the gravitational waves already tells us about the properties of the source. The phase evolution already tells us, in a sense, uh, what is the redshifted chirp mass and if one takes these parameters from the phase evolution plugs it back into the amplitude one knows that the amplitude falls off as one over distance so just from the amplitude one can then uh, one can then obtain directly the distance to the source there is a slightly tricky issue over here i didn't i i wrote something as the function of angles and uh, essentially, uh, the, uh, uh, essentially the uh, inclination angle or the viewing angle of, of the orbital plane of the um, gravitational wave source with respect to the line of sight that also modulates the amplitude. And I'm going to come back to this later. However, to a 
uh, to a first approximation, gravitational waves from compact binaries give us direct access to the distance, independent of the distance ladder. And in this sense, they are self-calibrated distance indicators. Now, all we need is a distance and a redshift to get to the cosmological parameters. Now, I wrote down the redshift distance relation, not the local Hubble's law, but this is the um, local Hubble's law extrapolated to larger distances. As you can see, the Hubble constant is out there, the leading order. However, we uh, the matter and dark energy density fractions of the lambda CDM model are also there. So in principle, uh, using a uh, relationship between redshift and distance, one should be able to measure not only the Hubble constant, but also the uh, matter and dark energy density fractions which govern the late time acceleration and uh, the late time expansion and acceleration of the universe. Okay, the distance can be directly measured with gravitational waves. The question now is, where can the redshift come from? The redshift in electromagnetic astronomy comes from spectral lines. Yes, uh, what happens is a certain spectral feature when redshifted appears at a different frequency, it appears at a lower frequency. Are there any such spectral features for gravitational waves? Our first, first question is, uh, are gravitational waves redshifted? The answer is yes, gravitational waves are redshifted. But if the entire gravitational wave is redshifted, then is there any spectral feature which we can latch on to and use to measure the redshift? Unfortunately, the answer is no for binary black holes. For binary black holes, uh, essentially, all the spectral features are degenerate with the mass. If there is a redshift, then the entire waveform is just shifted towards the, a lower frequency. So we do not really know whether the lowering of frequency is due to a cosmological redshift or whether this lowering of frequency is due to an intrinsic higher mass. However, if, there is neutron, if the object is not a neutron star, then the neutron star has characteristic frequencies. So one should ideally uh, be um, able to measure these uh, spectral features for neutron stars. However, these spectral features are so tiny that it's almost impossible to measure with the current sensitivities. So for this talk, we are going to fall back upon an electromagnetic measurement of the redshift. In summary, gravitational waves from compact binaries are uh, act as standard sirens in the sense that they are self-calibrated distance indicators. The gravitational wave observations give us a direct measurement of the distance. For the first binary neutron star, GW170817, there was also an electromagnetic counterpart. The electromagnetic counterpart led to a very quick identification of the host galaxy, and the host galaxy gave us the redshift. So we have the distance from the gravitational wave observation, the redshift from the electromagnetic counterpart, this together gives us cosmology. And indeed, uh, with, uh, 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 with the distance from the gravitational wave observation and the redshift from the electromagnetic counterpart, we obtained the first gravitational wave standard siren measurement of the Hubble constant, what we, uh, which is the plot in the bottom that, we, uh, that you see over here, what is plotted is the posterior probability density that comes out of Bayesian, uh, Bayesian parameter estimation algorithms. The peak of the blue curve indicates the most probable value of the Hubble constant, while the um, uh, rest of the the uh, rest of the curve indicates the probability of the Hubble uh, the probability of uh, a given value of the Hubble constant. As you can see, the probability is very high that it's 70, while the probability is very low that it's 100. And the shaded bands indicate the uh, the uh, the uh, dotted lines, uh, the dotted blue lines indicate the region where we can confidently say that the, uh, the, uh, the, the Hubble constant, we can confidently say that the Hubble constant is between some 62 and 82 with about 60% confidence with, we can say that the 
probability is between uh, that the Hubble constant is between uh, something le somewhat less than 60, maybe 57 to 110 with 95 percent confidence. This is what essentially comes out of these Bayesian parameter estimation algorithms. As you can see, the measurement itself is quite uh, has quite large uncertainties even compared to the uh, early and the local universe measure uh, the early universe and the local measurements which are also on the plot as shaded green and orange bands so we are nowhere uh, close to realistic precision yet uh, we have a 14 percent uncertainty currently but you should think of this as the first data point in the gravitational wave Hubble diagram so it's quite expected that it will uh, we have large uncertainties at the moment with more and more detections, we can combine information from multiple similar detections and um, uh, a naive scaling is that the precision falls off as one over square root of n, where n is the number of detections. So we have a 14% uncertainty right now with 14 square or, or, or 200 events, we are going to go down to uh, a 1% uncertainty, which is indeed going to be realistic, which is indeed going to be precise. I'm go, uh, uh, let me pause and ask if there are any questions on this before I move on. Yes, I, I, I would like to know which is the maximum redshift reach uh, with the gravitational waves for measure the Hubble constant. Um, maximum redshift. So, yes. uh, I, 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 until now, I only talked about uh, the binary neutron star, and this binary neutron star happened to be at um, essentially uh, forty megaparsecs. No. The other binary neutron star, which we detected, that unfortunately did not come with a counterpart, that has been detected at about a uh, hundred and. Uh, 60 ish megaparsecs. So we do expect uh, binary neutron stars up to a few mm, hundred megaparsecs, maybe with the current or upcoming sensitivities. Yes, okay. But I'm going to, I'm, uh, th that, that is going to be the very local universe. But uh, in, in my next few slides, I'm going to come to how we can go beyond the local universe, possibly trying to include some binary black hole observations as well. Okay, thank you. I also have a question. Uh, so my question is, what is the biggest part of the error budget in this uh, in this measurement? Uh, is, it, is it the 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 problem of determining the the properties of the of the source from the, the coast? very no? very very good question. So uh, as you can see on the plot on the bottom right, uh, 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 the distance uncertainty is about um, the. Distance uncertainty is about um, uh, 10%, while there's also a comparable uncertainty that comes from determining the peculiar the, for, for, for determining the peculiar velocity of the host galaxy in the local Hubble flow. And at least for nearby measurements, um, these are the two things that are going to majorly contribute to the error uh, error budget. So uh, for for the um, uh, for the uh, others who are not very familiar with the term, uh, in addition to the cosmological uh, cosmological redshift, um, uh, objects uh, uh, objects uh, in um, such as in in local overdensities are also kind of falling uh, into itself. So uh, the cosmological redshift is is essentially modulated by a local correction, which is known as the peculiar velocity. We have to learn we have to learn how big this peculiar velocity is, and we have to uh, take this of the measurement and uh, the peculiar velo uh, the velo velocity contribution as well as the uh, distance measurement are two of the major, major contributors to the uncertainty budget at least for uh, these standard siren observations with neutron stars. I see. Uh, I want to ask one question as well. Uh, you have mentioned this various uh, sources of Hubble constant measurement and some of them are from the so-called local universe and some of them are from measurements of larger redshift. It seems to me that uh, those two sets are 
sensitive in a different way or to a different degree to details of cosmological models? Uh, indeed, indeed, indeed. So, uh, uh, essentially, the local measurements are not really dependent on the cosmological model. The local measurements are a direct measurement. Uh, and uh, however, the local measurement is also um, the measurement in the in the local universe. The local measurement does not depend on the cosmological model at all. It is the early universe measurement which requires the cosmological model he, he, to extrapolate the measurement from the early universe to the current times. Thank you. Okay. Uh, in view of time, I'm going to skip this one slide on uh, mm, degeneracy between uh, distance and inclination. I can come to this uh, later on if there are questions at the end of my talk. But I'm going to move on to the next bit of my talk, which is what if a transient electromagnetic counterpart is not observed? So. My previous Hubble constant measurement essentially came from a gravitational wave distance estimate together with redshift from electromagnetic counterpart. However, only one of the so many sources which we have observed so far had a counterpart. The numerous gravitational wave observations are binary black holes which, which are not expected with counterparts. And the second binary neutron star which was observed um, in the third observing run and was announced early this year, also unfortunately did not have a counterpart. Can we uh, measure the Hubble constant or can we do cosmology at all with these sources without counterparts? The answer is yes. We can fall back on an idea due to Bernard Schutz and use galaxy catalogs for redshift in absence of transient electromagnetic counterparts. And to tell you how this method works, I'm going to run you through a, through a cartoon animation. So this is the first slide of the cartoon where we see a gravitational wave distance estimate, which is on the, which is on the uh, top left, which comes from the gravitational wave observation. We have a redshift value, which essentially comes from a counterpart or an identified host galaxy, just as what has happened for GW170817 with the distance estimate and the redshift value. We have a Hubble constant estimate. Again, all the quantities which are being plotted here are posterior probability densities. A high value indicates a more probable value. A low value indicates a, a not a very probable value. Uh, however, this is a, a nice unimodal estimate, uh, probably better than what I could show you for GW170817. What would happen if there was no counterpart uh, and hence there was no identified host galaxy? Looking at a galaxy catalog, one could, then one could then look along the line of sight and one could try to find a few possible host galaxies uh, in that line of sight or other cone of sight. And one uh, could uh, uh, look at all the possible host galaxies in that region and each host galaxy would give you a different redshift. So in this example over here, I have five different redshift values. So instead of a single peak in the redshift, there are five different peaks in the redshift while the gravitational wave distance information remains the same. If you take the distance information and convolve it with these five different redshift values, you would not get a unimodal H0 estimate. You would not get a unimodal estimate of the Hubble constant, but you would get a multimodal estimate. And some of these peaks might be so close that they might fuse into each other. So in this example, you see uh, H0 estimate with three peaks, two big peaks, and one small peak. Just from this estimate, it's not, we do not know which is the correct peak. It could be one of these two big peaks, or it could be a smaller peak. So this estimate is not informative by itself. Similarly, if we have a different detection with a different gravitational wave distance estimate, a different set of redshift values coming from a different uh, set of galaxies in a different direction in the sky, we would get um, another multimodal H0 estimate, which is also not informative by itself. However, 
of all the peaks that you see, one peak is approximately at the correct location, while all the other peaks are at random locations. So if you have many, many different observations like this, you can combine information from many different observations. And if you do that, the peak at the right location is going to get enhanced, while the peak at the ra peaks at the random locations are going to get suppressed, leading us to an unimodal uh, joint Hubble constant estimate and demonstrating the power of statistics in the method. This is, in a sense, how the method works. However, whenever we are using uh, a great statistical power, we have to be very careful about systematics in the problem. Systematics enters in many ways. The major, the leading source of systematics enters as selection effects, something which you might know as the Malmquist bias. And this uh, selection effect needs to be removed by calculating a selection function. Uh, I am not going to go into the details of how the selection function is calculated, but one of my master students, Ankan Sur, who is uh, currently in Warsaw, actually played a major role in correcting for uh, some of these gravitation wave selection effects. On the other hand, there are Electromagnetic selection effects, if you use um, a ga a real galaxy catalogs, then due to limited sensitivity of the electromagnetic tel uh, telescope, uh, there are galaxies missing from the catalog. And if you do not take into account uh, the, these galaxies missing from the catalog, then you would be led to a, a, a uh, you would be led to a bias in the results. So it's important to uh, essentially understand all these selection effects and correct for them. And um, uh, um, um, many of us in the LIGO Virgo cosmology group, including student Rachel Gray, uh, Ankan, who I already talked about, we put together. Uh, 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 code base that takes into account all these selection effects and lets us compute um, the Hubble constant from uh, threshold limited galaxy catalogs. We have gone ahead and we have done some simulations. Uh, with this, uh, with this, uh, uh, with this method, and uh, in these simulations, of course, the, these are the results from some of the simulations. And as you can see, of course, with the galaxy catalog method, since uh, there are many, many, po uh, there are many, many possible uh, host galaxies for every gravitational wave source, you do not expect to do as good as with the counterpart method. So the uncertainties with the galaxy catalog method is, of course, not as good as with the counterpart. However. We are not doing, we are not very, we are not very badly off. So, I mean, these simulations show that uh, the uncertainties may be um, uh, as big as a, as um, uh, uh, th that to get to the same uncertainty using the counterpart, using counter, using the galaxy catalog, one might need only about uh, uh, 10, only about um, 10 times more uh, sources than with the uh, uh, than uh, when one has counterparts. Okay, this is promising. The method can be made even more effective by weighting galaxies in proportion to their luminosities. Now, when I showed you my cartoon. I, uh, the, the, uh, the cartoon had various peaks at different z values. All the peaks had equal weights, but it is quite probable that uh, some of the peaks have more weights than the others, and it's uh, more probable that it's also um, a go not a very bad assumption that a galaxy which has more mass also has more probability in hosting the merger. And in this set of simulations, we show that if we indeed put in, the, if we indeed fold in this prob this pro uh, this uh, luminosity weighting, meaning the assumption that the brighter galaxies or the more massive galaxies are also more likely hosts then we, we improve the precision by a factor of about 1.3. However, this is already a very, this is also a very crude way of weighting. If one, if we can weight the galaxies in a more astro, astrophysical way, then we are possibly going to do better as well as be more accurate. So this is something that we are also thinking about.
okay the uh, next slide is uh, 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 is about projection since people ask me when we will when will we uh, get to uh, 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 reasonable uncertainties with the with the with the counterpart method and for now we can clearly see with with whatever method we have if we have binary sources at binary neutron star like distances without counterparts then uh, clearly with a reasonable number of sources we can get to uh, uh, precision that might be able to resolve or at least start hinting at resolution of this Hubble tension which I talked about. Now, um, sorry, may I ask yes. a question? Yes, please. So, as far as I understood, it, it is important to understand uh, from which, let's say, part of the sky the signal is coming, right? Yes. So I, I don't know how big are these patches, but can um, weak lensing uh, play a role in biasing the, 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 uh, yeah, the signal? That, that's really, really a very good question. So at least for the uh, at least for LIGO Virgo sensitivity, these patches are quite big, and weak lensing is not going to play a significant role. However, if we go to detectors such as the Einstein telescope where the patches are much smaller of one square degrees or smaller and there are numerous sources then we can also uh, then we can also affect uh, also expect weak lensing um, uh, first of all to uh, essentially influence these results and of uh, secondly to influence these results in a way so that we are also able to extract information from out of it does yeah. it answer your question yeah okay thank you okay now my last slide is uh, uh, on on the uh, on this uh, to topic is uh, uh, our result uh, with using all these numerous observations without electromagnetic counterparts essentially the the, the black holes and in this in this um, uh, um, uh, work we show that there is a contribution from black holes which leads to an improvement over the binary neutron star only uh, uh, measurement. However, as soon as I show this slide, I'm going to show another slide with all kinds of possible uh, system, uh, sources of systematics, which are very important to understand our results. Okay, for peculiar velocities, as I already mentioned, are important for nearby detections. If we are using black holes, then they are coming from farther away. They are not going to be very important. However, um, certain other um, systematic effects, such as um, uncertainties in galaxy catalogs, which have gone into the measurement are very important. Of utmost importance is understanding the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uncertainties in the red shifts. The red shifts for many of these galaxies are not photometric, are not uh, spectroscopic measurements. These red shifts are photometric measurements. They come from um, essentially measuring the intensities in various different, um, various different colors and trying to come up with um, uh, fit, uh, with a fit for it. Uh, now measuring uh, red shifts like this uh, leads to uh, uh, often a very large uncertainty, often an uncertainty profile, which is not Gaussian. And what kind of effect these uncertainty these uncertainties and their profiles might have on our measurement is not something that is very well understood. And in fact, I'm working with much uh, Machik on um, uh, understanding these uh, better. Together with this, we also use luminosities from galaxy catalogs for weighting. These luminosities are also uh, uh, not very well measured and their effect need to be understood. I already talked about selection effects. Along with that, there could be various population properties which currently bias our results and which need to be properly taken into account. Now, as we move towards more and uh, more precise measurements as the uncertainties bec become smaller uh, uh, then 
smaller and smaller systematic effects would also become important, including systematic effects in modeling the waveform and systematic effects in, calibra in the detector calibration. So eventually for gravitational wave cosmology, these effects are also going to become very, very important. I will very quickly uh, uh, tell you about some future prospects. One prospect is, of course, to, to one um, thing that we would like to do is, of course, we would uh, try to go uh, farther away. But galaxy catalogs, they become very, very incomplete. If we go further away, of course, there would be upcoming surveys, which would be more and more complete down the lines. But we also should start thinking about whether we can use galaxy cluster catalogs in addition to galaxy catalogs and whether they they can take beyond just the linear uh, redshift distance relationship. Now, uh, there could be effects. Uh, uh, one should ideally also include effects of uh, correlation due to galaxy, uh, due to galaxy clustering. And eventually, with uh, uh, with uh, uh, with many many gravitational wave sources, what, what one would expect with uh, uh, very futuristic detectors, it is also possible that gravitational waves could give information about the large scale structure of the universe independent of any electromagnetic observations. In fact, there was a recent paper, uh, there was a paper that was posted in the archive very recently last week on prospects of this. Some of the other things that uh, one can, uh, some of the other prospects of gravitational wave cosmology is something that I uh, skipped in my first slide. I mentioned that uh, neutron star physics might uh, get, uh, or, or tell us about, uh, already tell us about the redshift and this could be the, this could be the internal physics of neutron stars, which is currently uh, not very well known, but it, it is going to be uh, uh, better known in the years down the line. And it could be not just the physics, but also the astrophysics, such as the mass distribution of neutron stars that would give us information about the redshift since the uh, mass distribution is something in the intrinsic frame. If, the, if, if, the, the, if there's a known intrinsic mass of a neutron star and one observes neutron stars at a different, at a, with a different mass, then one would know that um, there is a, uh, there is a redshift and one would be able to measure the uh, redshift. Okay, now uh, uh, there are other uh, prospects which are also uh, currently being, uh, uh, being studied. We already uh, talked very briefly about weak lensing, but it's also possible that some of the gravitational wave signals which we are seeing are strongly lensed pairs the probability is indeed very low for the current observing run, uh, for the current observing run but with increased sensitivities it is quite plausible that we might observe a uh, uh, few lensed pairs and if we see a lensed pair of gravitational waves one can mm, uh, look at the time delay between uh, oh, one um, um, essentially detection and its pair detection and this time delay can tell us about uh, cosmology uh, much like the holy cow experiment. In summary, uh, I'd like to emphasize again that the gravitational waves have opened a new window to the observable universe. What we are seeing now is probably only the uh, tip of the iceberg. Uh, and oh, we already expect certain other certain other uh, sources, but there might be things that we really are not yet expecting. Of course, um, um, uh, so what uh, at least this uh, program plans to do is in the sh in the short term to measure H naught jointly with electromagnetic observations, and we have to be very careful in understanding systematic effects on both the gravitational wave and the electromagnetic side. However, in the longer term, um, there are prospects that gravitational wave observations either independently or together with um, 
electromagnetic, perhaps even with neutrino observations, tell us more about cosmological parameters. They uh, not only cosmological parameters, but they let us probe uh, gravity at large scales. I would like to emphasize once again that these gravitational wave standard sirens, they uh, uh, essentially, they measure distance directly. So if we are measuring a source uh, that is much, much farther away we are at a redshift of two, then we are really measuring uh, the distance at the redshift of two without any calibrators, without any anchors, either local anchors or cosmological anchors. So this is really a very direct measurement. And possibly at some stage, gravitational wave sources could become just another uh, rung of the, um, or uh, essentially another parallel probe for standard cosmology. Uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention and sorry for going a bit over time. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Arishman. Uh Yes, indeed, we are a bit over time, so maybe if there is maybe some urgent question then we could still take it but if not uh, what do you mean by we... urgent i just have a normal well, something question. which is crucial <laughs> uh, the, the, you're imposing that people are not asking crucial question i protest so can i ask my question or not yes you can just okay like thank it. you very much uh, 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 mr chairman so uh Archisman, thank you very much for your talk uh, uh, i definitely share your enthusiasm that the new window uh, to the universe has really opened, but I would like to hear your comment. Aren't you a little bit troubled that uh, we don't, so far we don't know much about astrophysical processes that lead to the formation of intermediate uh, inter, uh, uh, mass of black holes. We know that this black hole has been detected, but it's still kind of dispute how they can be created in the normal astrophysical processes. So, therefore, we don't know if they have, for example, big kick uh, velocities or are they maybe weakly uh, connected with their joint uh, host galaxies. Oh. So, do you think this kind of all systematic effects could really uh, devastate the accuracy, or you think with the enough numbers that you can beat them? Uh, indeed. So, uh, but, uh, but may I first ask what you mean by intermediate mass? Do you al do you already call uh, these uh, forty solar mass black holes intermediate mass? Or? Yes, the one the one that are okay. observed, right? Uh, from okay. The okay. Yeah, I, I understand that uh, some people would also consider uh, thousand consider masses. Four. Yes. Yes. <laughs> sure. So, uh, yeah, indeed, some of these, um, so indeed, some of these would be. Um, uh, are being investigated whether they're large kicks and and uh, kicks are going to kicks are going to influence the results. However, uh, 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 the, the thing. Uh, at, at the moment, there are uh, uncertainties which are much larger than these uh, kick velocities, and we are talking about. Uh, we are talking about combining information from hundreds or thousands of observations. If we have thousand observations, then these kick, uh, essentially, the uh, these kicks would be distributed in uh, random directions, and they would have kind of a more averaging effect than some of the other systematic effects. You, 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 do, 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 you see, do you see what I mean? They're, they're of course going to be... Of course, if they're isotropic, then should, they should cancel out if you have hundreds of thousands of them. But the, are we going to get there? Uh, are we going to get to hundreds of, th hundreds of thousands of detections? Yes. I mean, in uh, our lifetime, you think? Well, uh, uh, yes. I mean, we already uh, we uh, I, I already showed you we have we have sixty candidate detections from this last uh, one from this last uh, uh, run, which we have not uh, anal uh, which we have not fully analyzed yet. And uh, a thousand doesn't seem to be uh, th a thousand a thousand doesn't seem to be a bad number at all. Uh, I, 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 I mean, many of these sixty detections would be promoted to candidates. There would be a few. Uh, sorry, many of these 60 candidates would um, um, be promoted to detections. We would have a few other detections. The sensitivities are going to improve. 1,000 doesn't seem to be uh, uh, an implausible number at all. The question is how many of these 1,000 would actually contribute, given that, given that many of these are uh, far away, many of these uh, are not localized at all, many of these uh, are at a 
place where galaxy catalogs are absolutely em empty and um, uh, they, they, they are slightly more tricky questions to answer. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, the time will, will show. Thanks. Okay, uh, thank you, Wojtek. Uh, one more question. Okay, please. Just final one, let's see. Thank you. Uh, the standard model of cosmology, it correlates many more observational data or phenomena than the Hubble constant measurement. So somehow this is a typical problem with standard models. It's uh, difficult to twiddle with one parameter in order to improve one agreement without really distorting agreements in other sectors. Yeah, I I I I agree with the, I agree with the I agree with the statement. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, however, uh, from the uh, the thing is, it could be that the, it could be that the cosmology uh, uh, needs modification, or it could be that something is just incorrect with the other measurements. So, in any in either way, an alternate way of measuring is uh, is um, is of value. Thank you. Okay, I think we sh we have to stop because uh, we are over time. Uh, so thank you very much, Arjisman, and thank you for all all of you who participated and asked questions and listened. And uh, see you next week at our seminar. <laughs>